Today's masterclass, <clears throat> we're going to talk about being a professional player or how to become a professional player, what we believe makes up a professional player and all of the things that go around that, okay? Um, so hopefully it's a good way to kind of round off the camp. You, you've had your master classes, you've had your training, you've had your matches. Uh, a massive well done to the performance in the matches. Um, I think at times both teams done well. There was some good team performances and some good individual performances uh, within that. So to start off with, we're going to touch on what is a pro. Okay, so what makes up a professional player? Um, different aspects that make it up and also how I would define what a professional player is. Okay, so in the simplest of terms, a professional player will be someone whose sole income comes from playing football. Okay, so if you're able to live, if you're able to sustain yourself with the wage that you get from playing football, I would class you as, as a professional player. Okay, you can have semi-professional where you play football for a little bit of money but you have to do another job on the side um, and then that adds up to, to, to being semi-professional. Um, but if your sole income is from football, then we would class that as being a professional. Okay, in terms of what, what makes up a professional player, there's lots and lots of different aspects. Okay, so we break it down into technical, tactical, physical, social and psychological. Okay, you need to have certain traits within all of those areas in order for you to be able to compete at the highest level and sustain a career. Okay, because there's lots of players who have the talent, okay, but maybe they don't have the psychological traits to sustain a career. There's very different to uh, just kind of breaking through or having some success and actually being able to sustain a career over a longer period of time. Okay, so next page, technical master. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna touch on all of these different areas to start with, so I can go through with you kind of what makes up that area. Okay, so looking at technique, players have to have a very, very high level of technique. Okay, it seems very simple, it seems very basic, but you have to have that basic technical level in order to be able to compete. Okay, but it's not just about being good on the ball. It's not just about, as Simon said, just being able to do, do kick-ups. You know, that's a technical skill, but there's much more that goes into it. Okay, so having position-specific technical ability. What does that mean? Touche? Yeah, like what? Give me an example. Yep. Yeah. So centre midfield could be passing, any others we can think of? Yes? Yeah, controlling the ball, I think that's probably relevant to every position. I'm talking about aspects which are purely based on certain positions. Yeah, crossing as a winger. Defending as a defender. Very simple, very basic, but yeah, it's there. Okay, confident on both sides. Now this is so, so important, okay, and players are always gonna have a stronger and, and, a, and a less dominant foot, but we have to be able to be capable and confident on both sides if we're gonna be able to play, okay? Any professional player can do on their right and can do on their left, okay? They might not be as good on one as the other, but they'll be capable enough to complete actions on both, okay? And if the ball falls to you, in the last minute of a game on your, on your non-dominant side, you have to be able to do it. See, way too many players, especially in training sessions, and I've seen it from lots of players here, that adjust their body or move their body in training to always try and play on the stronger foot, okay? And then it doesn't improve. You have to make sure you're working on both sides and you're capable and confident to play on both sides. Technical mastery at high speed is all very well and good, being able to do these technical skills in isolated environments or slowly in training, okay? But in order to compete at the highest level, we've got to be able to maintain that technical level at high speeds and at high intensities, okay? In order to really compete at the top level. And last one is execution under pressure, okay? Playing football is a high pressure situation. If you're playing at the top level, you've got fans, you've got teammates, 
that are putting pressure on you all the time. You've got to be able to execute the technical skills under pressure. See it so many times when players are able to complete actions in training, but when they come into a match, the pressure gets too much and they're, they're just not able to execute uh, those technical actions at the same level. So moving on from technical, so football athlete, which one would this fall under of those things I said at the start? Physical, okay, so looking at the physical side. Football specific actions, what do I mean by that? Too sure again. Yeah. Uh, in terms of training, how we train physically, what's relevant, do we think? Is going for a 5K run really that transferable to playing football? Yes, Connell? Yeah. So what do we think about 5K run? Is it really specific and, and helps you in football? Intervals. Okay, see so many people going on these like 5k runs or hitting the gym and lifting big weights. Okay, and it's just not transferable to what you actually need in a game. Okay, you don't run in a football game for five, five kilometers consistently at the same pace. Doesn't happen. Okay, that might make you really, really fit. Mo Farah can run marathons, can, can win gold medals and run that doesn't mean he's going to be able to run around the pitch and compete. Because when you're playing football, it's explosive, it's intervals. Okay, and it's high speed. So when we train physically, we have to try and, rep try and replicate what's gonna happen in a game. So if we wanna train to get fitter, it's intervals, it's short, it's sharp. Okay, and we're looking at power, we're looking at changes of direction, different movements, and more than anything, it's a reaction. Because every physical action that you do in a match, you're reacting to something. Okay, so you're reacting to the ball going there and you're trying to get in and win it. You're reacting to the defender going past you or a person running and you're trying to chase them. Okay, so fitness in terms of football, you need to be specific in what and how you're training. Okay, being able to physically compete on and off the ball, obviously pretty simple but very important. You have to be able to compete. Speed on and off the ball, physical strength, balance and coordination. Very, very important. Okay, you see some players who are very small and you wouldn't think they're that strong, but they have a very good, they have very good balance, very good coordination, okay, and they're able to use their body. Sorry? Yeah, they're able to use their body in certain ways, which means that they can hold off stronger players. Okay, it's about your core, it's about balance, and it's about coordination. Changes of direction, really important, and changes of speed. But not just how quick you can start, is how quick you can stop as well, okay? So many times you're running at full pace, the defender cuts back. If you're not able to stop yourself in time, what happens? You go past him, he goes the other way, okay? So many people concentrate on how quick they can get off the line, but they don't think about those changes of direction and how quick you can stop, how quick you can change direction. And then obviously the last one being diet and nutrition. Such an important factor. Okay, your diet and your nutrition really is going to make a, a massive difference. Effectively, you're fueling your body, just like a car. Okay, cars, you have to put petrol in. If you put, if you put, the, wrong, if you put the wrong fuel in, the car's not going to work. Same with your body. If you're fuel, fueling your body with the wrong things, it's not going to work. Okay, and if I've got two players that come into a training or a match, and one of them's eating the right foods, one of them's not, it might be that extra one or two percent they can get out of their body at the end of the session or the end of the match that's going to make the difference. Okay, so we have to make sure we're focusing on all of these aspects if we're going to be able to perform at the highest level. Moving on again, football brain. What do we think this one is going to come under? Tactical. Tactical. There we go. Okay, you can see a couple of pictures there of, of, of Iniesta surrounded by players. Okay, and there's a great video as well. I know Simon likes where he's in the corner and he's got two or three players on him or four or five players on him, but he's so intelligent in his movement, they can't get it off him. Okay, and a lot of people say, and it is true, football is played in the mind. Okay, it's about how intelligent you are because there's always going to be players that have different strengths and different weaknesses. Okay, and I was watching a video yesterday of, of Messi and it shows that I think he walks around the pitch for like 
was it 85 percent of the game or something ridiculous? Yeah, because he's, he's an exception, but yeah. But he like he's walking for 85 percent of the game, and if you watch him, all he's doing is walking around the pitch, looking, identifying what's going on, where the weakness is, where can I find space, and then in the other 15 percent of the time that he's got the ball and he's moving at high speeds. He knows where to go, who to go to, who, who can I beat, where the players are going to move. Okay, because it's all played upstairs in his mind. Having knowledge of tactics and formations, especially when you come on events like this or you join new teams, different teams are going to have different tactics. They're going to have different formations. Okay, and if you haven't got a base knowledge of football, it's going to be very hard for you to adapt in those situations. Different coaches are going to ask different things of you and they're going to expect that you have some base knowledge of football, some base knowledge of tactics, and some base knowledge of formations. Not every single one of you is going to know every single tactic and every formation that you're ever going to play in, but can we get information on it? A lot of time in football we go through trends. Okay, you know, it was 4-4-2, then it's 4-3-3, then it's 4-2-3-1, then people started playing with wing backs, three at the back. A lot of the time we go through trends in how teams play and football develop. So can you keep up to date with the trends? Can you keep up to date with tactics that happened at the time? So it gives you the best chance to adapt and to thrive within different systems. Awareness on the pitch, so, so important. Who watched, I don't want to talk about it, but Tottenham versus Aston Villa the other day? Yeah? Did you see uh, Harry Kane's assist for Son's goal with his header? Who saw it? Yeah? And the little naught point 02 second scan that he'd done before he got the ball, flick header through and played Kane. So that just that one little look, it took him less than 0.2 of a second to notice where Sun was, do the header and it's a goal. Okay, and that goal purely comes from his awareness and his scanning. Okay, it's such an important trait and it's something which I don't think enough people work on. But also, it's about knowing when to scan, how to do it and if you're processing information. See, so many people in training that just start looking over their shoulder, they're not actually looking or even processing what they're seeing. So in that 0.2 seconds, he was able to check his shoulder, process information, and then complete an action. That's pretty difficult, yeah? To not even know what's going on in less than 0.2 of a second, to see something, to work out what to do, and to execute it. Okay, but that's the level, the, the top, top level, okay? And are we able to take on information in training? Okay, lots of information will be given to you, especially when you come on something like this. Can you be a sponge? Can you soak up as much information as possible? And then can you execute it and work on it and, and use it to improve yourself? Really, really important. Okay, a good teammate. What does this fall under? Social. Okay, so there's a list of core values. I'm not going to go through all of them because you can read that. Okay, but in terms of being able to cope socially is important. Football is a very, very sociable game. Okay, and the environment that's created in changing rooms, okay, can be hard for people sometimes to adapt and to, to fit into new surroundings. But if you can integrate yourself socially in teams, it, it makes your life so much easier. A little story, I know I've spoken about Kevin before, um, but when he went into Wickham, um, after he came on one of our showcases, there was two players that we, we had that were on trial. One being Kevin, and one being another player called Jacob Gardner-Smith. Okay, arguably Kevin was, is, a, is a, probably a better player, a player with more potential. Jacob is, is he's, he's, he's good, he's okay, but he's a little bit limited in terms of his ability and, and his ceiling of where he can go. But Jacob is someone who excels socially, he, he works really hard, he gets on really well with people. So straight away when he was in the change room, all the players liked him. They buzzed off him, he was socialising with them, he was very polite, nice to the coach, was able to socialise with the coach as well. Whereas Kevin, his, sec his first language was French, he had very, very limited English, very, very limited English, and he wasn't able to really integrate into the, into the social environment. So then when the coach, inevitably the coach, when he's got players training, his senior players, he's going to say to them, like, what do you think of him? What do you think of him? So when they go and say, oh, what do you think of Jacob? 
they're going to be like, oh, yeah, what a kid, like, worked so hard, done really well, we love him. And then when it comes to Kevin, they're like, oh, I don't really know much because he wasn't staying there for lunch when it was after training. He wasn't, like, going in the showers or, or, or staying with the guys afterwards. So his, his contact with the other players and with the coaches were limited. So people weren't able to form as, as good opinions on him. So that just shows there that probably Kevin was the, or Kevin is the better player, but Jacob was able to get signed because he fitted in socially a little bit more with the team and, and brought himself part of the unit. Okay, so being able to interact and, and adapt socially is a very important skill uh, within the game. Now this is so, so important. Okay, psychological side of it is probably one of the most important. Okay, it's something which is very hard to train. A lot of people are born with it or, or they develop it by their environment and different situations. But being able to cope psychologically is so important. If you look on here, we've got two little kind of scientific studies that, that has looked into athletes and what psychological traits the top athletes have. OK, so if we look at the first one on the left, so this is talking about successful athletes. They've done some tests and they found that these were the psychological traits or the personality traits that these athletes had. OK, so resilience, confidence, concentration, discipline, motivation, mental rehearsal and coping with adversity. OK, so these were all traits that these athletes had within them. OK, the most common ones. So these are kind of, yes. Mental rehearsal can be, so before the game, they sit down and they, they kind of go through situations mentally in their head. So that it's like visualisation. So they might visualise themselves scoring a goal. They might visualise themselves winning the game at the end. Or they might visualise that key moment in the game and it's, it's just kind of getting you in the right frame of mind. On the right, we've got some interpersonal catalysts. This is going to become a little bit clearer on the next slide. OK, but again... Some of these you'll see are very similar to the personality traits. Okay, so commitment, focus and distraction control, really important. Imagery, okay, so that kind of goes back to the mental rehearsal. Realistic performance evaluations. Why is that important? Why is that important? It gives you self-aware. Yeah. 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 It can go. It can go one of two ways. There's people that are way too overcritical on themselves. Okay, and it's that's never a good place to be. Where even when you do well, you're not giving yourself a chance to be happy. You're not giving yourself a chance to feel like you've succeeded. Okay. And then there's another one where people go way too much the other way, and they just think they're doing well all the time, and they never think they've done anything wrong. It's always someone else's fault. It's the referee, it's my teammates, you know, it's the, it's the grass was too long, sun was too hot, you know, the grass was too green. There's, there's always an excuse, okay? So it's about having the self-awareness to realistically evaluate your own performance. Quality practice, so the quality that you practice at. Goal setting, which we'll touch on later. Coping with pressure, planning and organisational skills and self-awareness which links back in to that realistic performance valuation. So if you go on to the next slide, you'll see a, a model. Okay, this was something that I learned quite recently. I saw it on a talent ID course when I was at West Ham's Academy. Okay, and it talks about the process of someone who has a gift, a talent at the start, or no, has a natural ability, and how that builds up into becoming a talent. Okay, because... We have a nature versus nurture debate. Who knows what that means? Yes, Touche. Yeah. What else? Who can talk to me about nature versus nurture? What does it mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so some people, some people say it's nature completely. So you have to be born with it and there's, there's, there's no kind of external factors that affect your ability to become a professional or to become elite in a certain aspect. Okay, and there's others that say it doesn't really matter how you're born or what skill you're born with. It's all about your environment and your coaching and how you get nurtured. 
I strongly believe that you have to have some sort of natural ability, yeah? I, it doesn't matter how much I trained, I was never gonna be a professional football player. It's impossible, okay? There's physical and technical um, capabilities that I just couldn't do. And there's people who just cannot be professional football players, no matter what happens. If they train for 10,000, 20,000 hours, there's just certain physiological, physical attributes they haven't got, which they can't become. However, there's lots of people that have it, have the nature, but don't become professional, okay? Because they haven't had the nurture. So for me, you have to have both. You can have just the nature without the nurture, possibly. Most of the time you need the nature and the nurture, but you can't just nurture something that didn't have the natural aspect, okay? But if we look at this, so we have natural ability, okay? Then we have a developmental process, which is gonna to lead to it becoming a talent. Okay, if we look on the bottom, we have environmental catalysts. Okay, so these are things within your environment that can affect your journey from nature to the talent. Okay, so the coaching you get, the support you get from parents, your school, the programs you go on. Up the top, we have the interpersonal catalysts that we just went through, those personality traits. So basically it's saying in order for the natural ability to become a talent, you need the environment and you need these things within you. And what does it say in the bottom left hand corner? There's a hell of a lot of chance and a hell of a lot of luck that needs to happen in order for you to get to that point. So from being born with a talent or being born with a gift to it becoming a talent which you can use to be a professional athlete, what needs to happen? A hell of a lot, yeah, <laughs> a hell of a lot in your environment, within yourself, and then all of that can be fine and you don't get that little piece of luck. You know, the scout comes to watch you and you has a bad game or you get injured on your first day of a trial or you just never get that opportunity. Okay, you just never know. There's so much luck and chance involved as well. If we move on. So our approach to training and matches. Obviously you can see the, the person in that video, the video is not gonna work on your presentation, but I'll send it into the group later. So that's Gary, who obviously coached with uh, you in one of the sessions. He's worked at, at Arsenal for over 20 years. He was Jack Wilshere's coach, uh, Ainsley Maitland-Niles, Reese Nelson, worked with all those players um, across his thing. Okay, and what he's basically saying in the video is that your approach to training and your approach to matches needs to be focused and geared towards development and the quality of your performance. Not this obsession with being scouted or wanting to get scouted. Because inevitably, if you're always putting your pressure, that pressure on yourself and that's your focus, you're not focusing on how do I improve, what do I need to do better and just trying to be your best. It's a distraction and it takes away. Simon will tell you the same story as me about a player called Cole who was with us for quite a long time. We went to Belgium with him on tour. Great player, really good technically, bundles of ability, the worst decision making you'll ever see. We just couldn't get him, no matter what we said or what we did, to make better decisions. He was always trying to beat players when it wasn't right. He was always trying to take on two or three players when he could have just beaten one and played it or just played a pass. And when we sat him down in, in, in Belgium when we were on tour and said, Cole, like, what the hell are you doing? He knew he shouldn't be doing it. He said, I know. I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I can't stop. Because he had it programmed into his mind that the only way he was going to get seen or scouted was if he beat players. That was just programmed into his mind over a six, seven year period and he couldn't get it out, could he? Yeah. But... If, if, his, if his mind hadn't been so focused on the scouting part and he was thinking about what he can do better and what he can improve on and how he can perform, he may, he may have had a chance because he had all the ability in the world, but he just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't get his mind around it. Okay. Marginal gains. Okay. So the power of marginal gains or the thought of marginal gains is can we get better every day? Okay, it's about can we do something every single day which even just makes myself 1% or half a percent better? Okay, because if you do that every day, 
let's say you get 1% better every day over 100 days, how much better have you got? Quick maths. 100%. Touche. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Whereas if we're lazy and every day we don't do anything, what's going to happen? Every day. We could get 1% worse. Okay. Or if we spend five days doing really well, we get 5% better. And then we spend four or five days doing nothing, then what happens? You're back to square one after those are in that 10 day period. So you could either be after 10 days be the same or you could be 10% better. Okay, so every single day, can you become better? Does that mean you have to train every day? No, you don't have to train every single day. It could be a rest day, but you, do, you watch a little clip or you watch some footage or you just make sure you eat healthy. Okay, not every single day of your life do you need to train. And there's loads of different ways to train. Train physically, train technically, train tactically, train socially. Okay, so when we done the masterclasses the other day and I asked people to put their hand up to come up and talk through their CV, those that weren't very confident but came up and done it, did they do something to improve themselves that day? Yeah, they trained socially by getting up and standing in front of a group of people. It's not an easy thing to do. Okay, unless you do it often, it's not an easy thing to do. Okay, I was very quiet, very shy when I was younger and through coaching I developed myself socially and now every time I do one of these talks, I'm improving, I'm getting better because I'm training socially. Okay, so there's lots of different things you can do. Extra training, nutrition, do you get enough sleep? Okay, so, so important. Amir talks about it in his masterclass as well. One of the biggest problems we have with our academy boys, some of the boys you played on, is their sleep and their nutrition. Coming into class, eating sweets for breakfast. Yeah? Come into class and they're like half asleep in training. I'm like, what's up? I was like, oh, I was on TikTok till 4 a.m. last night. How are you gonna, and then they wanna get into the first team. Then they think they can compete. Okay, and we'll, ha we'll have days where they're amazing. We, we went and beat Eastleigh 2-0 in the semi-final of the cup the other week. Probably one of the best teams we've played all season. But because it was a big game and they probably got an early night the night before, we were able to, to, to win it. There'll be league games where we play against teams that are like bottom of the league. that They, 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 just, they just piss it off, basically. Don't get a, an early night, think they're going to be fine, and then they can't compete. Okay, so these extra little things, the 1%, are going to make a massive difference. Personal conduct. Okay, so, so important. Go back to Kevin again. I said it in the last one before, one of the reasons that I still help him now for absolutely no financial gain is because I really like him, really got on with him. One of the nicest kids I've ever met and he, he's from a poor background in France um, and I just want to help him because I really got on with him and really liked him. Okay, and there's other players on these camps that I meet who I get on with really well and I'm so much more likely to put myself out there and help them then I am someone who I didn't really get on with or I didn't like their conduct, okay? I was getting on Jesse's back a little bit yesterday in the game. Not because I don't like him, because I do like him and there were certain things on the side when he was in the heat of the moment which I didn't think were going to put him in a great light to some of the people on the sideline, okay? But he's just a very competitive guy and you never want to take that out of it. Tushar, okay? I, got, I get on really well with Tushar, seen him in Miami, seen him here two times when he got frustrated he kicked the ball away in the game okay and I get on his back but that's because those little extra things people are watching I guarantee you because if a scout is going to recommend a player it's his name and his reputation that's on the line and in this coaching and scouting you're only as good as the last player you recommended if I recommend a player to the cl a club and he's late or he just tosses it off in training or he's rude to the coach. The next time I recommend a player, they don't take him in. That, that's how it works. It's as cutthroat as that. Okay, so your personal conduct is so, so important. Okay, yesterday, older players, did you stay and watch the whole of the younger players match? Some people went home. The younger players stayed and watched your game the day before, even after they'd lost quite heavily in the morning and then stayed and watched your whole game in the afternoon. Okay, so just little things like that. Nothing goes unnoticed, trust me. I will notice everything that's going on, on and off the pitch. And so will scouts and so will coaches. 
Okay, so as much as that sounds like I'm being a bit harsh, it's just, it's just the reality. And what I want to do for you guys is give you the harsh reality, give you the honest truth, so that you have the best opportunity and the best chance to succeed, not just in football, but in life. Okay, these are life lessons, not just football lessons. Okay? Okay, your route to a pro deal. Okay, because I have this kind of question a lot. How can I go pro? What can I do? Can you get me a contract in England? Can you get me a contract here? How can I move to England? How can I play in the Premier League? We done the goal setting thing with some of our players. I think I told you this the other day. The player who is playing for Hemel Towns Academy and wants his next step to be La Liga. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not possible. There's a route. Okay, can you become the best player in your team? If you're the best player in your team, then can you become the best player in your local area? If you're the best player in your local area, can you become the best player in your region? And if you're the best player in your region, can you become the best player in your country? If you are in that top bracket, you have a chance. Okay, the player from Brazil called Wellington. Okay, Arsenal wanted to sign him. He was playing for Brazil's under 19s and under 20s at the time. They wanted to get a work permit to bring him over to England so that he could sign. A player that had huge potential. They couldn't get it first of all. They put him on loan to Spain. He was playing in La Liga. They still couldn't get the work permit through. Uh, three or four years went by, three or four loan spells to Spain, and they just couldn't get the work permit. The British government wouldn't grant him a work permit to come and work and play in England, even though... He was playing at the highest level, but he never quite broke into the full national team. Okay, and there's a certain amount of games you have to play, and it's a points-based system, depending on the ranking, the FIFA ranking, and how many games you play, or if you're going to be able to get a visa. Now, I'm only talking about England. Different countries have different rules. Different countries have different trade deals with different places. You'd have to look into that more. But here in England, you've got to be playing at the highest level for one of the biggest nations in the world in order to be able to make a move over here to play football. And it's got even harder since of Brexit because before any European player could come here, now they can't. Okay, if you live in Germany and you want to play here, you might as well live in Madagascar or Brazil. It's no different because we're not part of the EU anymore. Okay? So it makes no difference whether you've got a German passport or a Brazilian passport. You need to have a British passport. Same if you have a, an Irish passport, as in the Republic of Ireland, which is, which is there, it's not the same. It have to, you'd have to be Northern Ireland to be part of the UK. Okay, so just something for you guys to think about and, and, and kind of keep your options realistic. The next one, what does it look like? Talk to me about that. Yeah. Yeah, you can see a very, very straight line in the first one. It's your plan. I'm here and my plan is to get there. But in reality, there's going to be a hell of a lot of ups and downs. There's going to be some amazing moments. There's going to be some terrible moments. Okay, there's going to be some challenges. There's going to be some obstacles. And it's going to be very, very difficult. Okay, here in England, we have less than 1% of players that play football, the kids that play football, sign for academies, okay? And less than 1% of those players that sign for academies actually go on and play professional football. Think about that, 1% of 1%. 1% of 1%, okay? Yeah. It is so difficult. Doesn't mean you don't keep trying and you don't keep going because you never know. So there, there, there are people that make up that 1% of that 1%. But be realistic and realise, if you're not dedicating your whole life towards it, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. And it's absolutely no problem to just play football for fun, to just play football for enjoyment, okay, and to keep trying and, and seeing what happens. I play football at not a great level, love football my whole life, and I'm still involved in football full time. Okay, I get up every single day for work, just feels like fun. All my friends, they're like, yeah, buzzing, it's the weekend, you know, I haven't got work. I work every day. Never feels like work. This is my work. Yeah, just coming here, talking to you guys, having a good time, being involved in football. 
You know, so there's other routes and avenues that you can go down in order to continue to enjoy the game and have a career. Okay? Rules and regulations. Obviously, I touched on this um, a second ago, but it just kind of, again, goes over some of the rules in terms of work permits and, and playing in England. Okay, so the points-based system, having to either have a British passport or you know, reach the, reach the criteria, okay? Inevitably, the government want, or the, the FA want, British and English players to come through, okay? They want good players to come in, top, top players, okay? But what they don't want is a massive influx of average or good players when we've got enough, you know? England is very, very different to the rest of the world. You know, we have one, we have Premier League, Championship, yeah. Nine two professional clubs, Premier League, Championship, League One, League Two, National League. Yeah. Yeah. So we have five professional leagues. And then we have two leagues under that, National League North, National League South, where Hemel play. And there's some clubs in there that are professional as well, that are full time. Nowhere in the world has that. Nowhere even close. If you think of Spain, you have La Liga, you have La Liga Two, which is not a great level. Yeah, and then below that, it's completely regional. So they have one, maybe two professional leagues. We have nearly seven. Yeah, so England is such a different place. It is the mecca. It is the centre of football. Okay, but we have a hell of a lot of players. It's our, it's our number one sport. Everyone plays it. Okay, so it is so, so hard to, to come here and play. Um, so just have to make sure that we're always being realistic because I always get those questions. Can you bring me to England? Can you do this? Look, if you're playing for your country, yeah, I'll get you a club tomorrow. Absolutely no problem. Okay, but if you're not, it does become very hard, if not impossible. Okay, goal setting. Why is that important? We've done a masterclass on it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so, so important. If you want to become this professional, you want to be a pro, you set goals. Okay, if my goal is to sign for an academy and I reach that goal, what do I do then? Set new goals. Okay, let yourself enjoy the moment. The hard, it gets even harder. As I said, 1% of players sign and then 1% of those players make it. So it gets even harder or it's as hard. Okay, so really important that we're able to just set goals. You can see it on here, make them smart, specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and have a time limit on it. Okay, all really important. Individual development plan or IDP. Okay, so this is something that all players within England in terms of like academies will work with. Okay, so an, I, an individual development plan is basically where we look at all of these aspects and we set goals and we set targets within it. Okay, so players in England will get a report and it will say what they're good at technically, what they need to improve on, tactical, etc. But within that, if you have something you're good at, do you stop training that? No. Why not? Yeah, we talk about having a 10 out of 10 or Arsenal speak about a 10 out of 10. So when, when, I, when, I'm, a, when a, I'm recommending a club, or recommend a player to the club, the first thing they'll say to me is, what is their 10 out of 10? Is it speed? Okay, is it finishing? Is it willingness to win the ball? Is it their mindset? Okay, what happens is, if you just forget, if you're really good at finishing, and then you're not so good at everything else, and you neglect this, and you work on this, this comes up, this comes down, and you just kind of level out as average at everything. So can you find a way and a balance to still work on your strengths, to make them that 10 out of 10? while also working on your other bits that, that can come up as well um, within that. So that is going to be the last slide, but we've still got some time uh, for some questions. So really, within that presentation, I just wanted to give you guys an overview of, from me, what I think makes up a professional player, what I think it takes to, to get to that level and to sustain it in terms of yourselves, what you need to do in all the different aspects, and also a little bit on the rules and regulations. Okay, we have about five, ten minutes left. So, questions. Remember, you need to ask questions. You need to gain knowledge. You can ask myself or Simon, who's here as well, if you have anything you want to ask. Connell, yes, good man.
Yeah. Yeah. Do you have to? If you if you if you if you're from England and you move to another country and you've still got a British passport, Eric Dyer, okay, he's English. He, he moved over to Portugal with his family when he was young. Spent came through sport in Lisbon, um, and then he moved back to Spurs. Did he go straight to Spurs for sport in Lisbon. I think he did, didn't he? Um, so yeah, he still had a British passport, so it's fine. Yeah, once you've got your passport, you got your passport. So yeah, Harrison who went to the U.S. Yeah. So yeah, that wouldn't be a problem.